platform. I mean, you've all seen this uh, data uh, between uh, 2007 and uh, 2017, the number of uh, uh, the valuation of platform uh, firms has increased uh, tremendously. And it's uh, not very surprising that under those conditions, uh, everybody uh, wants to uh, become a platform rather than a traditional firm. And this is the last example. Uh, I found even uh, farms uh, want to become uh, data centers, platforms, and so on. Actually, in this case, they did want to become um, a platform. Um, among the partners of a digital chair at uh, TSC, for instance, um, uh, Accor Hotel, uh, you know, which was a pipeline uh, company, has recently launched uh, a platform in order to uh, compete uh, with uh, Booking.com uh, and so on. Um, huge amount of uh, debates in uh, competition uh, policy uh, center about uh, the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, big uh, manufacturing uh, car, ma big car manufacturers are more and more becoming platforms where they integrate the data of lots of their subcontractors, and we don't really know how to manage them uh, from, uh, uh, from a competition uh, policy. And you can think of many examples. So this creates, I think, uh, two different uh, types of problem. Uh, one problem is from the viewpoint of the uh, theory of organization, the economics of organization. What does it mean that we go from a, a kind of you know, what we call a pipeline organization to a platform organization? Uh, the second one is what does it mean for the economy at large, and in particular, what does it mean for uh, public policy? Uh, the round table will very much concentrate on the uh, first uh, topic, uh, but uh, no, I, I do hope that it also gets some uh, things going in some of your brains uh, to think about uh, what should be done in terms of uh, public policy. Uh, we've got uh, three uh, very good uh, speakers. First, uh, Jean-Luc uh, Vincent Franc from, uh, they all speak French, so we're switching to French in about uh, 30 seconds, okay, to make. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Jean-Luc will uh, speak to us about uh, the Skywise uh, platform of Airbus, which is actually, uh, which is a really fascinating example of a way in which uh, company which you know, still used to produce planes, still produces planes, uh, also uh, produce produces <laughs> the, the data and so on. Yeah. And you've, uh, hopefully you've made sure that your uh, <coughs> uh, company used an Airbus to bring you to Toulouse. Okay. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Andre Hadjou from uh, Boston University who's been very kind because he was supposed to go uh, from uh, Singapore to uh, Boston and accepted to uh, stop in Toulouse uh, on the way, who's, uh, I mean, you, you, you all know that he's done a huge amount of uh, work on uh, the uh, architecture of platforms in particular, uh, but he's also done quite a bit of thinking uh, and uh, some um, uh, consulting on the transformation, the integration of platform uh, aspect into firms and he will uh, speak to us uh, about you know, what this process uh, entails. And uh, finally, uh, Patrick uh, Legro, who's uh, uh, from uh, ULB, who's uh, very, very well known for his work on the fear organizations, uh, we tried to kind of, we have, we've given him an impossible task because uh, there's been really no work done on the link between the theory of organization and this uh, transformation. So we've asked him to speak about it. Okay, so we'll see what he could do uh, over the Christmas break uh, in developing a new theory. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll try to keep the discussions relatively short. Uh, the last speaker is you. We hope to have a discussion uh, between the members of the panel and uh, you in the, the audience. Uh, Jean-Luc, if I can now get... Ah, it is digital normally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that you? Yeah. <coughs> ah.
Good afternoon. Um, just to give you a flavor of where we stand in Airbus in terms of digital world, uh, that story started uh, 40 years ago. We have started because before uh, 30, 40 years, we are speaking about IT, digital, and obviously a uh, lot of uh, uh, adaptation and services we have delivered to make our aircraft that will continue to fly uh, hopefully for the future. But two years ago, um, Airbus. Yeah, I will try. Um, two years ago, uh, we created a dedicated department called Digital Transformation Office. Uh, just with the ambition to uh, understand what's happened in terms of digital, but also accelerate. Understand uh, what's the new trend of technology and the new digital buzz world at the time uh, was meaning behind and what the application can be in Airbus. Uh, being an engineering and a manufacturing company based on processes, based on regulation, based on safety, uh, we were not so used to use really the digital as an enabler for speeding up. Speeding up. So we have spent basically two years to incubate first, uh, understand, look about the technology, what the te technology can provide to our business, uh, really make some minimum value practices that we can demonstrate to our business, that we can make things different, faster, and deliver value. That will be a term that I will repeat many times. Deliver value doesn't mean that we get money in our pocket. We speed up a process. It does not say that we will get straight a new budget in my pocket for developing something else. And we'll see later on uh, how that influences also the digital world. The business value is a key word which is challenging a little bit the uh, boundary in our big organization. So since I would say mid of last year, um, we have started to really have use case which uh, uh, after having obviously demonstrated and discussed with our customer, worldwide customer, but also the complete ecosystem, uh, everybody find a case to really get business value. And they were asking us to go further, to really make a digital world on top of the aircraft. And I will just tell you a little bit where we stand today and what we aim to do. So just to uh, give you also the understanding that uh, it cannot be one department in the DTO with uh, 60, uh, 100 of people that can really change a complete company as Airbus. What we aim to do is to really show and transfer the know, train the people but let them make the business value in their own department afterwards. We can coach, we can accompany. Once we have demonstrated the use case, it's up to the, uh, uh, let's say, stakeholder to make the business value happening. And that's very important because it's about transformation. This is not one guy in one area which is capable to change the company. It's all the companies that has to move together at the same time. So we have a vision. Uh, that vision has been spread uh, all across the company. Basically, everybody is happy to read it, but there is a but, because it's about transformation. It's about getting out of the comfort zone. It's about spreading the boundary. It's about more collaboration. And obviously, it creates a lot of friction everywhere. Having the, let's say, uh, organization which is working pretty well, but at a pace which is today not the right one, where we want to speed up, when we want to really enhance, foster the collaboration, it creates some reluctancy, which are human beings. So for overcoming that, we have uh, uh, invested in new talented, new skills all across the world, which are today capable to demonstrate, to accompany the business, the technical evolution, and in particular, the uh, uh, so-called buzzword, and uh, we have some of them where we have already uh, progressed, and we have skills, we are transferring the know-how to the business, but it's up after to the business, to our business, to take it, to adopt it, and to make their own transformation. Knowing that we are there behind to accompany and to make sure that uh, the company is continuing to sustain the effort all along the cycle. So I will not go through that, uh, you know, basically all the, the topic, the big data is one of the most uh, uh, interesting where we have uh, 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 today, and that will be the, the next uh, discussion connecting the dot, uh, ensuring the digital continuity, res restoring the digital continuity all across the 40 years of legacy system, which has been built in different organizations, in different countries, in different, uh, uh, let's say, life of the, uh, the product, 
Uh, most of them have been uh, uh, upgraded, some of them have been retired, but some are still there since 40 years and still delivering aircraft. So you can imagine that even the no internally in Airbus is not yet uh, uh, anymore in. So we have a certain level of maturity. We are not excellent everywhere, and we were discussing about an artificial intelligence, which is uh, something where everybody is dreaming with that uh, term. But today, clearly, we are not engaged significantly on that. We are still monitoring, looking at, experimenting, but not really uh, moving forward in that uh, fast enough in that direction. Um, one of the most uh, mature is obviously the analytics, where uh, uh, the business value we're coming from. Uh, putting uh, all the objects of the company together, starting to combine them and <coughs> analyze in a different manner, uh, overcoming all the boundary uh, from the former silo, uh, I don't like that term, but anyway, it's the case, engineering, manufacturing, uh, 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 flight test, and so on and so on, when you put all together the data and you can really, from the design down to the in-service uh, uh, data, demonstrate the behavior, the way the data and the aircraft and the product and the uh, quality is evolving. It helps a lot, either to improve the design, either to reduce the cycle, either to improve the performance of our product. So that's where we are the most advanced, and it's that particular line where our customers were pushing us to go further. For that, we uh, introduced something in the company, which is, sorry, uh, I don't like too much that, which is to say uh, we have two big project, digital projects in the company. One which is much more long term where we need to rethink all of our processes from manufacturing, design and support. This is something heavy, which will have a, a significant cost. It will run up to 2023. So we are injecting obviously uh, 3D experience and many things with the, um, the technology, but based on the existing process. We cannot today switch off and switch on with a new system from one day to the other. We need to continue our craft. We need to continue to secure the deliveries and the safety of the aircraft. So this one, the first one is called Digital Design Manufacturing Services. This is a complete company project, but this one will take times. It will reconsider the process, stretch them, make sure that the digital continuity is a real enabler for the company tomorrow. Meanwhile, we have also oh. enabled a data lake with a lot of analytics feature with a lot of user-friendly interface, which are really helping us now and our customers to rebuild the digital continuity. It doesn't say that there is no big challenge, but it's about cloud, it's about analytics, and it's about data. I will go a little bit further. Having launched that two initiatives, they are completely complementary. One will be the repository of the source of data. It will be a long-term journey to rebuild the digital continuity from, as I say, the design up to the in-service aircraft, managing the full cycle and being capable to really look about the pain point, remove the friction, and obviously generate more business value, reducing the life cycle of the development or the uh, troubleshooting. So we launched a brand which is called Skywise. Skywise is a brand which is aiming to really develop analytic services all across the ecosystem. When I say ecosystem, it starts with Airbus, for sure. We experience ourselves all the benefits of that uh, platform, but we are also uh, delivering services now to our customer, the airlines, and we aim to go further with our supplier and even more with the whole ecosystem of the aeronautics. It's a race. Um, we have basically, we assess two years, one and a half years advance compared to the competitor, but everybody wants to be the platform. Everybody wants to be the reference to really host all of that data, uh, being capable to link that data, provide a business value to the customer, whatever the customer can be. It can be, as I say, the airline, the one which are operating the, uh, the aircraft, but also the passenger, but also the authorities, which have an interest, and more importantly, the supplier. Our supplier, which are providing part for the build of the aircraft, but also to maintain the aircraft later on, have a real interest to see how the part be, uh, behave, to reduce the cycle, to manage the stock. So there is immediate business value when you start to combine all of that data together. So the ecosystem is the target. Uh, we decided to start by our customer, the one which are really willing to get that business value. And let's say that we have a, an exponential adoption today. 
even if we are asking to sign contract and uh, you will understand why, because obviously we cannot go like that opening data to everybody and without having a minimum framework of contractual framework with the company, in uh, let's say less than eight months, we were capable to convince more than 50 airlines and that 50 airlines are already getting the business value of that platform by putting for their own transformation all their own business object together, linking them, making the digital continuity and speeding up the process. I will show you some case <coughs> later on. Just for the sake of time, I will uh, a bit speed up, but uh, uh, feel free to raise questions after. <laughs> so basically, we have three drivers to uh, generate value, and even more, but the one, that one has been uh, somewhere uh, acknowledged by everybody. The first one is internal of any vertical branch. The ability to really link the different departments, the object of any department, procurement with design, with manufacturing, with uh, support, with after sales. Uh, we are all working in silo in that big company. And uh, the fact that we can put the data in the same place, link that data together, and combine through the analytics, that data to deliver value is creating already for their own purpose a competitive advantage. That's the first one, vertical one, which is called internal. Providing that space is already enabling business value for our customer. The second one is about industry. If we are capable to partner with the other, in particular benchmark, look about the best practice applied by one of my competitors, but in a neutral way, we can benchmark ourselves. We can obviously approve the way we practice the business. And the third one, which is Working transversally, how can we really share the speed, the uh, benefits of linking together the different processes, independently of the competition, which is still there? Because there is a lot of friction everywhere in the system, which is just latency. If we can reduce the latency, we already save a lot of money. And save money is not necessarily hard money, but it's just to make our passenger feeling more comfortable. If I can reroute a flight, preventing that the passenger is sitting three, uh, three hours in the airport, it's already a benefit. It's a customer satisfaction, right? So just linking between the airline and the airport, and the airline being capable to reroute another aircraft which was on the tarmac because the MRO informed that it was available, it's already making a lot of progress in the airline uh, business. I will stay generic on the, at that level. I think that you can uh, uh, raise questions later on. In, uh, let's say, less than eight months, as I say, we were able to provide the platform, to provide the self-service to the airline, and to gather the trust of the airline, because it's about trust as well. They are sharing their data. We combine their data. We are uh, enabling them to make the analytics with their own data, but we are also providing them neutralized data to benchmark as <coughs> sorry, themselves which is a huge value. Um, obviously, they will not compare. Uh, if I take Air France, they will not be capable to compare with Lufthansa. This is not the purpose. But with all the company in Europe performing with a 320 and uh, uh, fuel consumption or the uh, availability of the aircraft in average is already a benchmark for the airline to see if the aircraft is operated properly and if they can improve the way they operate the aircraft. So that's already 53 airlines which have already committed to come to the platform. We aim to get 100 uh, airlines, which is the critical size that we have assessed to be the platform on the market. And we aim to get, <coughs> to get that by, let's say, uh, end of 2019, and uh, to be a bit challenging, uh, hopefully by mid-2019, then we can really develop use case with the airline. We have offered them 25 what we call workflow. The workflow are something which is quite simple. You can develop it in less than a week. That's the purpose. We are not developing huge uh, uh, application, but just linking the dot, making the digital continuity within the airline, and showing them the business value that they can extract. The adoption has been immediate. Now we have some challenge. Anyway, uh, having said that, uh, you can imagine that uh, offering all of that, it's offering also a lot of key challenge in front of us. I'm not discussing about business case. I'm not discussing about uh, make convincing the airline and getting a contract signed. But <coughs> there is, behind that, people is a challenge. Because people have two mindsets. One which is willing to go, the other one willing to protect. Because they are afraid. And that's really something which is about change management. 
which is about mindset. And we are seeing that internally in Airbus, but we are experiencing the same with our customer. And in particular in the IT department, where they were somewhere the king of the place, and now we are offering to uh, the end user the ability to do things which was taking weeks, months, years sometimes. In two clicks, they can get the analysis done. Security. Security is uh, uh, for many systems now on the cloud. Uh, it's really a threat. Um, it's a battle, it's a race. We never win. We can only lose. Uh, we are deploying uh, a lot of resources, thank you, uh, to, to at least be uh, in front of the security and being capable to anticipate rather than react. Data governance, uh, it's also a subject that is uh, really uh, uh, touchy. We are facing, obviously, internally, the way we, di we deal with the data to make sure that it's the source of truth. We have so many sources of data that sometimes we doubt, and it's the same everywhere. Um, but we have also to face to the compliance. Compliance to the GDPR, the personal information. Compliance to the export control, which is a regulation worldwide. So this is opening new things which was not as of today, uh, 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 on the table since it was operated internally. Organization, leadership, as I said, uh, it's really uh, amazing to see how some people feel really frustrated because we are providing the transparency, the complete end-to-end -end, uh, visibility on the data, which is opening, obviously, opportunity, but also uh, a leadership issue. Technology, uh, we are moving fast. We want to continue to move fast. Uh, it's very demanding. But it's also sometimes challenging because our business rely on things which has to be up to run 24 by 7. When an aircraft is flying, there is no way to have a disruption and not be capable to monitor what's happened. It's becoming business critical. And business critical on new technology, it's a challenge, I can tell you. <coughs> and then uh, we are also experimenting new way of working based on Agile technology. Agile technology, uh, it's also another mindset. We are not discussing anymore as we were discussing roadmap, business plan, and so on. We are really now agile, making incremental improvement, discussing with the customer and not sp spending time to write specification and to reread uh, the specification to validate and so on and so on. It's really 300 people now which are working on a plateau, clearly, a complete plateau and uh, working in agile mode. We call it scaled following a methodology which is called SAFE. We are not mature at all, we are experimenting. It's improving every day, but it's a real challenge, but the benefit is there. We are today connected directly with the airline, directly with our internal customer, and we are able to deliver the value immediately. Or in a question of days, and not in a question of months, neither years. That's really where we have also another challenge, which is about cultural change. It raises another point, which is about threats. The threats of the change, the threats of getting out of the comfort zone, the right to fail, because it's also the case. Uh, sometimes we are failing, we go fast, but uh, we have the right to fail. But the be benefit is that uh, the time to fail is short, then we can succeed faster as well. I will conclude on that one, and um, we'll be open at the time for the question. Thank you very much. Is this okay? I'll try to speak loud. You, you guys can hear me, right? In the back? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, not coincidentally, I actually have the same first slide as Jacques. Um, I mean, not surprising, just it's a good background for everyone today talking about turning products into platforms. So and the idea here is we know, we've known for like the past 10, 15 years that platforms are very valuable. Now, if you look at the companies that we tend to mention here, all of these companies were born as platforms. I mean, you know, the platforms they rely upon were platforms from day one. So what we're interested in here and more generally uh, for other companies that were not born as platforms is, well, under what conditions uh, should we try or attempt to turn product or services into platforms? I mean, that's obviously a very good question for Airbus, but I think it's true for most companies 
that are not Facebook, Google, and, and so on. So actually, before, we say, before I talk about how you turn products into platforms, there's an interesting question, like why would you do that? So why is, why is the rest of the world envious of platforms? And the answer is very simple, right? It has to do, so actually I got this from, uh, from Intuit, which is a company that I work with on this transformation, and this, one of their executives said, listen, it comes down to fear and greed. So fear is, I'm in this competitive battle, so every day I have to put up a better feature in my product than my competitors, and that's very exhausting. So you're coming up with new features all the time, it's actually, and you don't really get sustainable competitive advantage. Meanwhile, he's looking you know, at the rest of Silicon Valley, at companies who have platforms, and the idea is, if I become a platform, com competition becomes easier. If I'm the successful platform, if I'm the, you know, the really the big platform guy in my industry, to some extent, I can relax a little bit, right? Because of network effects, you know, the idea is you, know, you, you have more sustainable competitive advantage. And the greed part should be pretty easy. It's also related to this. Again, if you become a platform, I have a product, and somehow, magically, I turn this product into a platform, uh, what I'm hoping to get out of it is, well, new sources of revenue, more stickiness, switching costs, you know, the, the kind of dominance that, uh, that platforms typically tend to enjoy. And I just wanted to show you this picture. I mean, if basically nothing else makes sense. Uh, this is like a really good illustration of what you're hoping to get if you're a product company. So I didn't come up with this. This was the picture that Harvard Business Review created for, for an article that I wrote on turning products into platforms. And I think it captures what we mean very well. So I'm hoping everyone here knows Transformers. <laughs> you should watch. It's great. I, 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 feel, I always feel funny like making the publicity for that movie in France. It's a great movie. It's very insightful. Uh, especially after you read the article. So the idea is like you take a product like a Volkswagen Beetle. It's like a tiny little enough, like, product. And then all of a sudden it transforms into this big beast. That's what, you know, that's what this should evoke, right? You become a platform. Some, somehow it's like a lot more powerful. So anyway, um, now just want one, one note before I get into the how you turn products into platforms. I mean, the answer for a lot of companies is probably at the end should be no. So I actually played this game, and I've, I've done this a few times with my students now, where I take a random product, typically boring products, I actually did bottled water, and I ask them, how would you turn a bottled water company into a platform? Actually, since we have 45 minutes, maybe we should, we should, we should try this with the audience. We should try it with a bunch of different products and services. You can have a lot of fun with this. But you, know, you can do this, and you can be very creative and think about many different ways in which any product or service has some way to become a platform, at least in principle. But at the end, obviously, the answer can be no, right? I mean, at the end, maybe the organization, there's organizational issues or like lots of other problems. I may say, look, I mean, it's an interesting idea, but it doesn't, it doesn't work for everyone. You should stick to being a product or a service. However, I think it's a, it's a useful exercise for more companies than probably recognize it. So let me give you, so this is basically what I described in the, uh, the Harvard Business Review article. Uh, I'm going to go through four different ways in which you can turn products into platforms. And I'll just use a bunch of examples. I'm happy to talk through others. And in particular, I was thinking as uh, Jean-Luc was presenting, which one of these applies best to uh, Airbus? Actually, I don't have a good answer for now, so we'll talk about it later. <laughs> okay. So let's start with the first one. So this, I would say, this is the easiest and the one that everyone kind of has in mind. I have a product or service, I have customers, and then there's a bunch of third-party sellers who may benefit, who are actually very interested in reaching the same customers. And basically what you do is you give access to these third-party sellers to your customers within your product. So it has to be within your product in order for that to become a platform. So very <laughs> simply, I mean, the easiest example is the iPhone. I mean, I know it's hard to remember now, but initially when it was first launched, the iPhone was not a platform. I hope everyone remembers this. So for a year, it was a closed product. They did not, like specifically said, we do not want third party developers. Now, uh, when we look back in retrospect, say, what are you thinking, Apple, right? I mean, it's very obvious that this should be, should be a platform. So what do they do? They simply took a product and then they open it up to third parties. You know, they open up a software APIs. We kind of understand how that works. And then they build products with it. Uh, similar thing for Salesforce. So Salesforce, I would say, is probably one of the most successful transformations from a pure product company, which was customer relationship management, into a platform. So Salesforce today, it's mostly, a, it's much more a platform than it is a product. And basically it's the same idea. They just invited a lot of third parties to offer the developers to offer uh, other pieces of software products to their own customers. 
And what's interesting about this is, especially in the case of Salesforce, they also invited companies that at least partially competed with the offering with the baseline Salesforce product, which I think is, so it cuts across all of these examples. I think the idea of turning a product into a platform works even if the third parties that you're inviting are actually partial competitors. And actually, I have a paper about this now with Bruno Giordano, who I think is not here, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. Well, I'll present it tomorrow. In some kind of remote country. In some warm country, I, I know. Um, okay. And then, so by the way, so obviously it's very easy, and we, it's very easy to get carried away and do this with digital products, but I do, I mean, I do also want to have, you know, to give you a sense that this is definitely possible for boring, you know, brick and mortar pro products. So, gyms have started to do, at least in the U.S., there's some big box uh, fitness centers or gyms that do this. So the idea here is, something like the New York Sports Club, instead of providing all their own classes with all their own instructors, they said, listen, we can't keep up with all the new fitness trends like Goat Yoga and stuff like that. We'll just get third-party studios to come in and they essentially they rent out space to those third-party studios to run classes within that gym. Uh, there's lots of interesting things about the arrangements, but basically it's no different than Salesforce, except it's not software, right? So the idea is I invite third parties, I give them access to my customers under certain terms, and then you know I kind of control. I still have some control over the relationship. And there's lots of. I mean, there's a lot of examples here. So this is very recent in Europe. Uh, so banking, you, you can start, start seeing the same example. So Deutsche Bank was one of the first ones. They opened up access to their customers to third-party banks or deposit sellers to actually kind of competing with Deutsche Bank. And the idea is, well, yes, they're competing, but at the same time. There, there will be a platform for this. We'd rather be the, you know, we'd rather become the platform, even at the risk of kind of disrupting ourselves or like losing some of the, uh, some some of the value that we offer to our customers and giving that to, to these third parties. All right, so that's the first scenario. The second one uh, is a little bit different. So now suppose you have a product or service and you have two customer segments. For whatever reason, there's two customer segments, and suppose they want to interact with one another um, outside of your product. And the idea here is like I can become a platform by enabling that interaction. So I should have said this at the beginning. When I say platform, I really, and I always assume for this audience is fine. I always, I'm thinking multi-sided platform in particular. And so I know in, in this street, people use the platform much more loosely than we use it here. So when I say platform, I really mean there's multiple customer groups interacting on the same, you know, on the same, uh, on the same platform which is different some, sometimes in industry when they say platform, it could be an internal platform, uh, it could be something that's not really you know, used by multiple external groups. Here, like, it really has to be multiple external groups. So a good example of this, this is one that I worked on uh, at Intuit. So Intuit QuickBooks is like boring financial software for small businesses. And they realized, like, long story short, they realized there were two types of small businesses. There's like regular small businesses, this could be restaurant or whatever have you. The other one is also small accounting firms, and small accounting firms could be one or two people who just do accounting. Now, what do all small businesses need? Accountants, like every small business needs an account at least for taxes. So what they realized is that there's definitely, a so there's a big demand for both sides to interact with one another, and you know, prior to this, they were kind of trying to find each other offline or online for other services. So Intuit decided, you know what, since they're both using QuickBooks, it actually makes a lot of sense for us to add a matchmaking feature within QuickBooks, which allows small businesses to look for accountants that fit their needs and vice versa. And literally, when I, you know, I was sitting in the meetings to, in, in which they were thinking about how to design this product, they were using the dating club analogy. So it was like, should this be like match, whatever, match.com for accountants, or more like Tinder for accountants, or like eHarmony, this is like long-term relationship. No, it's true, like it's all these design decisions, like how many, for example, how many accountants do I need to show them? Like is it three, is it five, is it one at a time, or, and so on. But the point is, you know, they took this and they said, look, this is like, there's no different than actually the traditional two-sided platform for dating, and we're just gonna incorporate it into QuickBooks. That's one. Um, here's another one, which is kind of interesting for a reason I'll come to in a second. Uh, do you guys know Diablo? Anyone play video games here? Okay, so uh, you can correct me if I'm mischaracterizing. It's one of these like very immersive, like it's very popular video games produced by Activision Blizzard. It became so popular uh, that people started actually trading, um, what's it called, like in-game avatars and weapons. So you know, it takes quite a lot of time to actually accumulate very powerful weapons. And people started trading those outside the game, so typically on eBay, for actual real money. 
And so the developer Activision Blizzard realized this and said, listen, this is actually, it's good news, right? I mean, there's, it means there's a lot of demand for the game. We should do that ourselves. So they said, let's actually add, uh, uh, what do you call it, like a, a marketplace, which they call the auction house, within the game, where people can actually trade these weapons for real dollars. Now, yeah, I do this with students, ask them, do you think that's a good idea? And invariably, most people say, yeah, that's brilliant, right? I mean, it actually you know, increases uh, demand for the game, engagement, and so on. So here's the, part, the funny part about this. The auction house was launched in 2012, and then they closed it down like a year and a half or two years later. So you can ask yourself why. So you know, I'll spare you the suspense. The issue here is the following, and I think it's important to be aware of these. Because on the surface, like every, again, if you get very enthusiastic about, I can turn any product into a platform, this seems like really like a good idea. So what happened here, and you can easily see it with the game, right? As people start trading more and more of these, it basically kind of undermines the whole point of the game, right? So I can, I, I don't really play video games. I can go in and spend, say, I don't know, $100, $200, and get to relatively advanced stages, thereby completely obliterating people that have spent, you know, actually put real time working in the game. Now, that may be fine, I mean, it depends what you want, but obviously, like Activision Blizzard, their whole point is like, we want to build a game that actually engages people. So they realize it was reducing demand you know, for, for, for the game, and then they said, look, this is actually like this platform idea actually is taking away value from the initial product that we have. So they completely uh, discontinued it. So it's, a, you know, it's an interesting example. Uh, third scenario, how much time do you have? Uh, yeah. You've uh, spoken eight, uh, 17 minutes, so you don't have too much more time. How many? <laughs> you begin at two times, but it's eight or nine, and I'm too slow. Wait, so how much, you have to decide, I mean, I can do five more minutes? Five more minutes. Yeah, five is fine. So, uh, I've done this in nine minutes once, I think. Uh, okay, so the third one is similar, but, but quite different. I'll show you the example. So here, it's, it's quite, so same company, but suppose now you have two lines of business. So it's not the same product, I have two lines of business, two different products. And similar to the previous scenario, imagine now I'm trying to connect the customer groups of these two lines of business. So I'm gonna try to enable some sort of interaction between the two. Uh, sorry, uh, I miscounted. You've got six, seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> then, I can, then I can stop. I'm so. It's okay. Um, okay. So here's, mm, let me see. Well, I'll just do one example. This one's funny. It's in the article. This one's less obvious. Uh, also, I worked, I consulted for this company uh, quite a bit. Uh, okay, so Equifax, there's three companies in the U.S. that do credit scoring. It's Equifax, Trans uh, TransUnion and Experian. So they have two main lines of business. The one of them is selling actually credit information, credit supporting information to uh, financial institutions. So let's say if you go and get a mortgage or any kind of loan, a car loan and so on, the bank will have to decide whether you're credit worthy or not. The way they do this is they have to ping uh, Equifax and ask, is this person you know, credit worthy, should we, should we lend to them? Uh, so that's like the main line of business, like 80% of their revenue or something like that. The other line of business is to directly to consumers. So as a consumer, I can go to Equifax, ask for my credit score, and also get some sort of services that enable me to protect my ID, or in case my ID got stolen, you know, take measures to limit the damage. That's 20% of their business. So up until I started working with them, they basically, these are separate lines of business, you know, as, as you probably know, like in organizations, they almost didn't even talk to each other, even though you can easily see that they're related, right? I mean, it's built on the same information, I mean, the same information flows between the two, and clearly there's some synergy. Now the interesting part, just because you have data that cuts across these different lines of business doesn't mean you have multi-sided platform, right? So the exercise that I did with them was really interesting, was, well, how can we connect these two different lines of business and turn this into a true, something that will qualify as a two-sided platform, right? So it was this idea of how am I gonna, what am I gonna enable between consumers and lenders that turns uh, two products into something like a two-sided platform? And the idea that they came up, came up with was something called digital credit ID. The easiest way I can explain this, think of it as uh, the equivalent of, a, you know how you have a Facebook profile? And you can take that Facebook profile to log into different sites. So Facebook, it's called Facebook Connect. So I can take your, my Facebook login and go to Airbnb, a bunch of different sites. This would be very similar. So there's a profile, which of course is not your party picture, but in this case would be information about you that's objective, that's verified, and that's relevant to, relevant to credit lending. So there's that profile that you have so stored in the cloud by Equifax. And you can take that profile anytime you go to a bank or any kind of financial institution, and you basically can give them access to your profile so they can decide 
on the spot whether or not you're credit worthy. Of course, you have to decide the controls, like how, how much of that information is self-reported versus objective, whether or not you can reveal, you have to reveal all the information or I can suppress some of the information and so on. But the idea is, again, it's very similar to Facebook or LinkedIn, you're creating actually clear interaction that is enabled by Equifax, which did not exist there before. Uh, well, long story short, they actually put this stuff on pause. I don't know if you guys know, but Equifax had a major data breach in 2017, and this is because they did not listen to the advice that I gave them. I always, have to say, I always have to say this as a disclaimer. I used to be very proud of working for them, but then this, this happened, so it's not, uh, perhaps it's not a model company, at, at least at this point. Uh, but I think this is, a, this is definitely a very valuable idea, and I, I still think they're pursuing it. All right, so the last scenario that I wanted to talk about, I think this is the most difficult. So this applies particularly to, to companies or products that are B2B. So the idea here is I have a product, I have customers, and then my customers also have customers. And they're selling them some sort of service or product which is based upon the initial product that I sold them. So here I can ask the question, can I close the loop again trying to become a two-sided platform? Can I close the loop by going to my customers' customers and offering them something that enhances the value of the product they, they got from my customers? I realize it's a little bit confusing, uh, but I'll give you an example. Um, so Shopify is, I, I think they're the largest, one of the largest companies that provides tools to e-commerce, uh, you know, companies that, that, uh, that want to build their own e-commerce websites. So you and I can build an e-commerce website, we can do everything from scratch, or we can buy tools from Shopify to basically build uh, order fulfillment, you know, all the back-end stuff that is actually relatively commoditized at this point. Now. We, as the e-commerce website, then we have to go out and get customers, right? So we can sell whatever we want to sell, like economic papers or you know, bottled water or whatever have you. So now you can ask the question, well, how can... So Shopify at this point, right now, they're just a B2B, I mean, they're a glorified product. I mean, on their website, actually, if you look at it, they call themselves a platform, which I find super misleading and super annoying, because a platform in this case just means I'm a B2B product, and basically my customers build something on that product, and they sell it to their customers, but it's in no way a two-sided platform. Now, how could you turn this into a two-sided platform? It's an interesting question. So it would, this would have to involve Shopify going to the users of their customers and basically giving them something that is related to the, pro, to the, to the products that they get from the e-commerce websites. So you can think about multiple, uh, multiple things, like say a common loyalty program or a common user login, like the one we talked about, uh, like Facebook Connect or something like that. And the idea here is it has to be something that enhances the value of the relationship between their customers and the, and the users. And of course, the key difficulty here, I mean, if you ask, like, is this, like, why is this difficult? Well, if you're an e-commerce website and you have the supplier of tools and all of a sudden this person says, you know what, uh, I'm going to actually provide some sort of service. I'm going to go around you to your customers. I mean, how do you think the e-commerce website will feel? There's this idea, I mean, there's this sense in which you're kind of trying to commoditize your customers. So this is why this is actually pretty, I think it's pretty difficult to pull off, but at least in principle, I think you know, there's, it's something that a lot of companies could, uh, could consider. So anyway, these are, like, these are the four, four scenarios. Like I said, I mean, I'm, I had a lot of fun with students, like going through a bunch of examples that we can do a lot more if, if we have time. Uh, just a few concluding thoughts. I mean, maybe this would be a good um, uh, transition to, the, to, uh, to Patrick's presentation. So I think you can do this with lots of products and services, very clear why. A lot of companies you know, are very interested in these, uh, in these ideas. Now, the problem, sort of the main difficulty I would say, that I, at least in the limited experience that I've had working with a couple of these companies in, in this process, is that it requires a pretty big shift in mindset. So when you're doing product, it actually turns out it's very difficult, it's very different from building platforms. So, most important, obviously, when I produce something, a product or a service, I'm fully responsible, everything depends on me. If I move to a platform, to a two-sided platform, same thing, the idea is like now I rely on third parties to provide services or products to the same customers, and I don't fully control those third parties. And I'm sure this is a big deal with Airbus, right? I mean, and actually, that's why I think I'm reassured that Airbus is still a product, not a platform at this point. <laughs> I, think, no, no, no. I think we're all better for it. We're all better for that. Uh, but you can see how it, it's tricky, right? I mean, you're not, I mean, again, you, you start like, you dealing with people that you don't fully control. And of course, then there's also lots of organizational mm -hmm. issues. I mean, you have to reorganize, you have to re-incentivize people to, you know, to build products rather than, um, rather than services. Okay, let me stop. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you for the mm. transition. I sort of disagree that uh, producers control over production. I explain why in a minute. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Well, more control. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, so this uh, Patrick was, was very proud of his first slide. Yeah, I spent a lot of time when, when, uh, when Jacques gave me the assignment you know, from, from uh, pipelines to platform. I sort of understood pipelines uh, from an organization point of view and for platforms and, and the, from platform. Uh, going to platform was sort of uh, was sort of new, but so I will anchor my discussion on what I know and try to go a little further, and I will focus on Airbus because Airbus is here. So this is why I don't quite agree that Airbus has full control over, over its production. This is basically a cross section of the supply chain of Airbus in 2003-2004, um, where you have basically this this is done by computer scientists and it's very frustrating to read because they have, everything is really the firm here, all nodes are firms. Uh, but anyway, so tier one are basically the direct suppliers of tier zero, which are the OEM, the wind, avionics, and etc. Tier two supplies the tier one. Uh, tier three supplies the tier two. And you have here something like 500 suppliers. And Airbus has something like 12,000 suppliers possible that they can choose from at a given point in time. Right? The problem is that, you know, this is production. This is how you produce an Airbus. Okay? Um, and why is that important? because it's like a sub-economy, so you want to have, understand how to organize the sub-economy, and we'll see what is very important will be how to integrate or how to you know, contract with the suppliers. The second thing is we have a shock now, we have a technological shock, okay, which could be you know, internet, could be the internet of things, could be anything. So how, what, what will change? For you, how do you want to leverage this technology? Is it a good idea to leverage? Okay, and then you can think of doing two things. You can do a lateral things, you can create something that a new activity, and actually sky, Skywise is some, somewhat like that, that is linked to the other one, but it's very different, uh, in order to leverage uh, the pipeline. So you expand the scope, very much like you know, you are a firm, you decide to create a new product, a new service, but the, the, the technology enables you to do it. Okay? So that's a lateral thing. The second thing will be the vertical thing. Forget about platforms, you have these new technologies, let's do it inside, Increase the logistics, you know, increase management. Uh, potentially, you know, if you believe in blockchains, you decentralize completely the supply chain. You automatize the supply chain. You have a smart contracting through the chain and all of that. Um, and, and a very, very old example is the trucking industry. In the 1890s, uh, they started to put uh, computers on trucks. And they said. Sorry? It's the 1890s. Yeah, you, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for, for listening. Uh, and there is a nice paper by Uber and, uh, and, uh, and Baker showing basically what happened. So on one side, you know, you have a monitoring possibilities that increase. You can monitor what truckers do. On the other side, the logistics enables what, what this type of things can do is increase logistics. And what you observe is that actually you had a lot less employment by independent truckers. Independent truckers disappeared for employment in order to benefit, to reap the benefit from coordination through, through, the, through the vertical chain. So the technology can change the way you supply or you produce, and this is important. Uh, we'll see that again in a minute. So the good news is that I understand a little why our firms organize production, and we have some, some, some things that are important, how to contract upstream and downstream, okay? Uh, ownership, control over decisions. If you integrate a supplier, you can give him more design, you can impose a design, you can, you can you can have a more coordination with, with what he does. You can choose a range of product activities. Again, you can integrate a supplier or you can even bypass completely suppliers and decide to produce within your, your, your plant. And or you can centralize and decentralize also decisions through, through different means. And the good news is that when we think of firms, classical firms, pipelines, we see them as creating products and having to do this type of uh, thought process to organize the supply chain. The good news is that when you think of platforms, platforms organize markets. But the economic forces from an organization point of view to think of the pros and cons of uh, platforms will be very much the same. You need to contract with upstream, downstream people. Uh, you need to decide uh, the, the range of activities that you want to put on the platform, etc., etc. Obviously, the network effects look very large and change the magnitude of these effects. 
Okay, but the good news for me when I say to look at that is that perhaps there's not so much difference in the way we may go about understanding how these things function and need to be organized. So let me tell you what, I, what we know. So this is a pipeline. So we go from you know, the 12,000 suppliers to what economists believe the pipeline is. You have basically a tier one supplier here who has basically two tier two suppliers. The tier one is basically gives, let's say, some avionics to Airbus. So let's call that the firm for the moment. And you have an isolated supplier here with a potential supplier, maybe you know somebody else. So you will be important as well. So the first thing to, to when we think of firms, the firm may expand vertically because the firm may integrate suppliers. Right? That's a new firm. So that's the problem of calling firms anything. The firm here will be that. So what is the benefit of, of integration? And why do you want to integrate now rather than later? How does the technology change this desire of integration? This is basically at the core of what we are trying to understand in organization theory. So uncertainty, information about suppliers will be important. The need for coordination is also important because coordination may happen more easily within the walls that you can control than outside. Uh, uncertainty may also, uh, may also be important. And here is very, there is a very nice paper by uh, Rachel Crompton and uh, Min Hart on basically the type of uncertainty. Aggregate uncertainty seems to matter less than actually obvious aggregate uncertainty among suppliers. And if you have a suppliers where basically you have a lot of noise among them, then actually having a network of suppliers very much like, like you seem to have at Airbus rather than integration may be a good idea. You know, the model's uncertainty, you know, is very ambiguous. Uh, and in the last 10, 15 years, I've developed with Andy Newman basically a very simple theory of value which is to say the desire to integrate is basically trading off what the benefits of coordination versus the fact that when you integrate suppliers, they lose control on the decision. Mm -hmm. So you have very simple trade-off between the benefit of coordination, which is often a monetary benefit, versus the cost of coordination, which is often a price cost. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so you see that when the product prices increase, the value increase, okay, the coordination benefit will look larger than the price cost, and therefore you tend to integrate more. And this prediction this seems to be, to be actually born in, uh, in empirical works. So it seems maybe one of the motives. One of the other motives, actually, of uncertainty plays some role, but it's, 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 very, it's more delicate. So this is what you have. And the important part here is that when you have a firm in the classical cycle pipeline, other firms, competitors, let's say Boeing, uh, and other, other users are closed. They don't access your firm. Okay? So this is what. We understand, I think, pretty well. And you can put that in a competition context where you know A and B compete, are duopoly, or where you have entry, and, and, you can do, and you can do that. So let's look at the topic of today from pipelines to platforms. And let's take the, the view that the new technologies enable firms to expand their, their, their activities laterally, but they can also use that technology vertically. Okay? So another example that is very close to Skywise, but this is more down to earth because it's quite close. <laughs> this is John Deere. John Deere basically uh, created a platform which is called my John Deere Com, and these basically planters are connected. You have basically 77 processors, uh, six million lines of code, and basically they can connect basically the farmer to a central unit and to other farmers, and again some parties can come in to help them choose their planting depending upon the weather conditions, depending on how it's not valid. So why is a good idea from John Deere uh, to, to develop this type of platform? Well, when you think of platform, you think of install base, you think of network effects, and how can you leverage this to gain competitive advantage and sustainability in a certain way. And for John Deere, it's clear. They have an install base of farmers using tractors. Okay, and at the end of the day, will be, again, the data collection and the performance of the platform will be, will be there very much like for Airbus will be the planes, the fact that they send planes to companies, the fact that they will get data, uh, and, uh, and for Uber is the software and data. So data is very large, obviously, in this asset, but the beginning will be the, the fact that you can basically create an install base very quickly. Okay, so from a, from a theory point of view, this, is, this was a little shocking because ownership here, is no longer the same as control. Uh, in order for, to get control over our suppliers, uh, you need basically, if you have a platform that functions well, and that is basically essential, 
uh, then all you need is the ownership of this asset because even if the other asset holders will have a residual right of, of decisions, the house adoption link to this right is very small. So in the bargaining, you extract the bank. So let's, let's go back to our pipeline and let's look at uh, Airbus, John Deere, deciding to expand their activities by creating a possibility, a platform, that enables basically other firms, other users, to connect to the platforms. And here we have our isolated, you see our isolated supplier who was not producing, but who can provide services now to these firms that has expanded laterally. Okay? So, so this is what you have. And the big difference is obviously the firms that you have before is that you have this open segment here for this part of the firm. And one of the benefits of the platform is not only to provide new value here, but potentially also in the interaction between the product development and the platform, because the information you have about in aggregate would be very useful for developing trades. And this is very important because digital economy is very large, but at the end we want plates, we want chairs, we want, we want good products, right? Uh, and in the case of planes, indeed, we want very good products. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so, so this is basically wha what you have, but you see you have some type of uh, lacquer. So now the question for quality is what will happen vertically? Okay, now, will these incentives to integrate will change vertically? And here I have no, no, I have no answer to that. I don't know, I haven't done the, the work. Uh, but this is, at the end, what will matter for this part of the firm, the product, the, product, the production of the, of the good, the quality of the good, how you reorganize, you reorganize the production as a function of what you, what you, what you get from here, okay? So, and this is, I think, uh, open because I, I don't know, so. Uh, but this is my way to, to link the two. Uh, from pipeline to platform you, is basically going from basically one product to another activity. But what do we know? We have a producer may decide to integrate suppliers or to buy them. This is what we know from the old uh, literature, I would say. But by the same token, a platform may decide to provide its own pipeline or, or, to, or to make them, actually. So I would say <laughs> from platform to pipeline is as much a question that you want to ask than from pipeline to from platform. And what does that mean? So let's take a pure platform where you have basically products here. So now we have products and we have basically users here. Okay, and the platform basically match them in a nice, they organize the market, okay, in a nice way. Okay, so what about integrating with the pipeline, with products? Uh, if I think, for instance, of Amazon and Whole Food, for me, this is a little like that. If we think of what uh, Thomas, some Thomas told us this morning about Alphabet, and the base free, uh, there is also some of these elements where you basically put into your firm products that will be active on the platform, okay, you integrate them. Or you can decide actually to make rather than to integrate. So you make basically products that will be part of the platform, and the firm is now not only, not only the platform, but also this uh, big red uh, segment. And if you think of Netflix in 1997 versus Netflix in 2019, uh, you have this change from basically purely providing streaming services versus providing actually the product, which is a content. Okay, so I think I think going from platforms are new. The activities that are new are going to in a mature phase, not mature phase. There will be some shutdown in the industry, and I think for the same reason that uh, the old the old technologies, the old the old industries have evolved in, in integration, disintegration, and, and the like. We may observe the same type of things, not only laterally among mergers among platforms, but also a change in how they define themselves in terms of product space. So I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now we uh, begin the discussion. First, do you have any comments about uh, each other? Number eight. Yes, actually. So just, I wanted to emphasize is that I didn't have time, but I think Patrick's uh, presentation made that very clear in my mind. I think it's, there's one thing that is very important to like... Remember to speak of, yeah, there's, there's a very important difference between, again, multi, like being a product and being a multi-sided platform and not just like a regular platform. And to me, it's basically, uh, I had this question at some point, someone was asking, what's the difference between outsourcing and being a platform? And that is actually, I think, what's very important here. Outsourcing is essentially like you. Ha you, you I can have that network of suppliers that you had. There's a million of suppliers. I can even call it an ecosystem. I'm fine with that. The difference is at, at this point, Airbus, at the end of the day, they control the relationship with the customer. 
Like, I don't care how many supplies Airbus have. When I'm an airline, I buy from Airbus. If there's something wrong with a part, you're, you're, you're responsible. If I'm on a two-sided platform mode, that's actually very different in the sense that I'm now inviting third-party suppliers to directly connect with my customers. I don't have full control and I don't have full responsibility for, for, for those transactions. And that's very different. Obviously, it's a little scary in the case of Airbus, but maybe we'll get, I mean, if it's especially for critical parts, right? You're probably not going to have some supplier going, hey, would you like a new wing with that plane uh, that you bought from, Air, uh, from Airbus? But I think that's very, like, it's very important to distinguish the two. So it's no, I fully agree. I have to restrict my attention to very simple case where you're the traditional producer yeah. who creates a platform provide add-on services or additional services to this point. I would say for the quality-wise, these questions of you know how to organize the supply chain is very important. Uh, when you think of the Dreamliner, the Boeing yeah. 787, 40 months delay with 10 billion cost over run. And what has happened for the production of uh, Dreamliner, they shifted from a system of, uh, of control of suppliers where they gave the design and basically had a very, very, very tight relationship with suppliers so a system of outsourcing where suppliers have a lot of independence. So this, this change in, in integration, if you like, had huge um, real consequences. In this case, it was only delays. Right. But you, okay, so, so it's, it's why you say, I mean the control over, over the right. quality. Right, so it, it, it would be even more delayed if now the suppliers would actually have to independently supply those parts to the customers. Like, you already given them the control, but like you still have to buy the stuff from them to integrate into an airplane. Oh, you mean a uh, consumer comes with a wing and... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> buy, the wing, buy the wing here, buy the yeah. engine there, and then... But no, the, OEM, the OEMs will be at the end of the chain. Yeah, so. that's, yeah. That, so that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Luc, did you have any... No, no, I, I'm really interested because basically what has been said is part of the uh, uh, Skyways project because it's about the internal transformation. We are discussing about the supply chain, we are discussing about the our supplier, but when we look about the digital services, we are getting beyond our product. We want to really enable new things, new digital things by putting those collaboration across the so-called ecosystem. Meaning we have no interaction today with the direct passenger which is in the airline and used by the airline. If we are capable to really make the dot and having a better service for that passenger, because the airline is also happy by getting new business value, she will connect the passenger, but the passenger will be also being secure that he will be on time at the uh, destination and he would have an aircraft uh, safe uh, at some point of time. He can even predict that the, the weather that he will pass through uh, will be at certain point of time the one he expects. He can even uh, change the clothes in the aircraft. So that new services that we are triggering, when we are discussing about third party, this is typically the business model that we have behind Skyway. For sure, today we are building the ecosystem, we are building all the data continuity, we are getting the data from the airline, the way they use, the way they operate the aircraft. But tomorrow, offering all of that set of data to third party, which will create new business value, new models, and new things that we can even not imagine today, uh, that's the aim of the uh, SkyWest platform. So meaning that we are dealing with an uncertainty, we are sure that there is a value behind, but we don't know exactly where we go. And clearly the data, the data and the, the, the truth of the data and the availability of the data, which is a challenge, the availability of the data with the privacy and all of that, is really where we truly believe that there is a value and new opportunity for doing business for others. In addition to the product, the product is linked to the DMS project where obviously we are seeking for collaboration. More, let's say, interaction with the supply chain, as we say, that will be part of the development, will anyway still lead and control because safety reason uh, our product. But anyway, we want to have them more and more involved, not only on the design, but also on the life cycle afterwards. And that's where the supply chain can really play a role, not only just the part for the bulk, the placement on the aircraft, but make securing that the, the in-service life is somewhere hand over to the supplier and the continuous improvement may happen. As we say all, there are some threats, because the business is not anymore the same. When the supplier is giving a brief to print <coughs> and I told them uh, exactly what they have to do and we are handling somewhere the responsibility of the safety and the consistency of the aircraft, this is slightly different when we are handling also to them that responsibility. I've got questions, but uh, any questions from you? Yes, yes more, more like a question. 
trying to understand the discussion. I mean, this is the, I, I view this like the classical uh, agency problem, you know, uh, and the limit of, of the film, you know, and kind of the same discussion here. So, uh, I want to go more in, in, the, in the insight of um, uh, uh, the outcome of, of computation in, in, inside platforms, for example, in, in the way that when you transform, transform yourself or your product into a platform, in, that way, in a kind of way, or in understanding the, in the dynamic way, at first you are allowing for competition to entrance in, in your uh, your vertical integration, huh? uh, but I mean, with time, uh, and if you don't screen, for example, I mean, you, you know, screen quality, you have uh, bad suppliers, you have, you need to control anyway those, those kind of things. So you have cost over there also. Yes. So until uh, until what uh, what what are the the limits uh, uh, in those aspects? I mean. Uh, I enroll uh, in, in, in the line of discussion that uh, not all products can be turned into a platform. So uh, you can uh, assess a little bit more about it and how Airbus is, is, is dealing with uh, What maybe was misleading is that when we open the platform, it is not only for the Airbus aircraft. We have also hosted the Boeing one, the Bombardier one, the Fokker one. All the aircraft from the airline are now fed in our platform with the privacy rules which are obviously implemented on Skyway. Sky this is not just Airbus aircraft, this is for the aeronautics. Meaning any airline are feeding in Skyway all of the aircraft and fortunately they are from Boeing. Well, okay. But we do prefer to have Airbus, but they can do the same analytics versus Boeing against Airbus or against any other and cross-check all of that. It really trigger competition. We don't have control. But I mean, the control means what? We protect our business, and tomorrow, in any case, someone else will do it. Okay. So then, seeking for excellence, meaning if the airline is saying the Boeing is better than yours because he's doing that and that, it's also pushing us to really improve our product. So that's really something where we believe it's a platform. I insist on that because we are basically on the four uh, items you mentioned in. We will seek for third party, which will also deliver new feature, combining Airbus product, Boeing product, Embraer, and so on, for the airline, for our customer directly. And for sure, we want to get a part of the business value because it's about business. But in any case, we trigger that. And we are not fearing the competition. We are not willing to get the full control of that because there is a lot of uncertainty, but also a lot of value behind. Can I? I'll, so just, uh, I'll just add one more one more thing here. So it's exactly what I mentioned earlier. Like I, that the idea. The, the possibility of turning your product into a platform makes you look at your competitors in a very different way. I mean, you have to be willing to actually invite the competitors. Yes, I mean, of course there's going to be competitors may take away, may substitute away some of your value, but I think the point is I can create more value than it's going to be substituted, even by inviting competitors. Yes, I think that's actually like, it's, 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 a, nice, it's, a, it's a nice example. Or, uh, yes, I, I thought the, the discussion of safety in the um, Airbus ecosystem um, helps to focus uh, attention on what exactly is the difference between, say, uh, the Airbus ecosystem and something like Heathrow Airport, which uh, invites a lot of different suppliers of, I'm talking about the consumer side of Heathrow Airport, you know, sellers of uh, jewellery and clothes and uh, uh, restaurant meals and so on, where um, there's a safety aspect, obviously, but the different suppliers of, in, of the restaurant group, for example, are not free to choose their own standards of hygiene, and it's relatively easy to inspect those in a way that's completely orthogonal to the reason why you would have lots of different restaurant suppliers, which is that there's real value added from knowing the different uh, preferences of the different consumers. If you want Wagamama noodles, you go to one place. If you want Gordon Ramsay plain food, you go to another place. And, so on. and that's the kind of thing that would be quite difficult for um, uh, Heathrow Airport management try and figure out in advance if they had to supply all the food. Now, that suggests that, that you know, it's not about whether safety matters, it's about whether safety uh, is, it can be uh, assured on a relatively small number of dimensions, or whether safety is a huge multi-dimensional problem as it is in your ecosystem. Um, 
you can't have the equivalent of uh, sort of food, food health and safety inspectors coming in, checking the restaurant, and then leaving the rest of it up to uh, whoever supplies the part. So um, I, I think that it, it's useful to think about the multi-dimensionality of the mission critical elements of the platform as helping to figure out what's, what can be uh, centralized and what can't. And that also helps us to think about slightly less dramatic choices like, well, I mean, this is an example I use often to students, you know, why does Uber control the prices of their rides, whereas Airbnb allows the um, uh, owner of the property to, to set the price of their, of their uh, uh, accommodation? It's because you can take your time when thinking about where you want to stay in Airbnb, but you don't want to be sitting there with your, your plane, or at least I certainly don't want to be sitting there uh, figuring out the different prices of the alternative riders, plus how nice the inside of their car looks and whether their conversation looks interesting uh, while I'm uh, trying to catch my flight. And so with all, with all of those things, I think the, the real issue is that if you've got relatively uh, small numbers of dimensions, you can let the platform make those choices. If you've got large numbers of dimensions, you really want to hand those over to the third party. Agreed. 80%. 20% <laughs> remaining are linked to the regulation and the way the aircraft are designed, where the safety is a mandatory feature of the product itself. And we cannot replace a part by another because the supply chain or the uh, supplier is capable to do it cheaper, faster, and whatever. It's also something which is well regulated. Uh, it has to be uh, demonstrated as a design feature compliant with the aircraft all along the cycle. And that's where uh, there is a, a difference between the food or the car uh, manufacturer. We have a regulator which is really uh, stamping, approving the design of the aircraft, and not only for the first month, but also for the life cycle. It does not prevent to uh, change a product by another one. We do it every day, basically, uh, for many reasons, mm -hmm. reliability, price, whatever. But it has to follow a process which still guarantees the safety of the aircraft, which is the feature of the aircraft to be a safer transportation. And that's the reason it's, yes, but there is that uh, small difference. Jack, can I add one, one Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I think, it's a, I agree there's the degrees of control, but I think there's one, one other element that's very important is the degree of responsibility, which is, but not necessarily perfectly correlated with control, right? So in the case of Airbus, again, something happens, Airbus is responsible. Like, I don't care how many suppliers or whose suppliers fault it was. In the case of Heathrow, there's food poisoning at a restaurant, you'll hold the restaurant responsible. I may get, be mad at Heathrow that they let that restaurant in the first place, but I think that you know the degree of responsibility you have is not is not quite the same. But I mean if I can make one other point there, there's also the interconnections between the choices of the team. So I can choose to go to one of or one of Manzi, but I can't choose to have a different level of safety on my flight than than you have. Fair enough, yeah. Fair enough. Good point there. Uh, so it's a general question. So I guess if Airbus is successful in developing the platform, Boeing cannot do the same, right? So it's kind of just one platform. So when we're talking about pipeline to platform, it's actually to some extent replacing some kind of competition, however restricted or equalistic, with effectively a monopoly, one big platform controlling most of the market. And you know, we don't like when supermarket chains merge because you know consumers may suffer the same. This is a very good point, and uh, that's also the reason we have a brand which is called Skywise uh, to be still, uh, let's say, powered by Airbus, but who knows tomorrow? Uh, and there is a platform is uh, in the race today, for sure Boeing wants to do the same, but even the MRO, the uh, uh, repair uh, operator which are maintaining the aircraft, wants also to get a piece of the cake. The ecosystem we mentioned is for the airport, want also to build their own it's a real race. Uh, we have the chance, or not by chance maybe, but to be a little bit ahead uh, uh, today on that platform and offering services, by the way, for free at the beginning. Where the business model will come will be much more to valorize the data, such as the Salesforce did in the past, starting with a, a, an offer, creating value, and then offering more value by getting the data, and the data will have uh, to be monetized. But clearly, this is a race, and there is nothing to prevent today, and by the way, it's the case. Uh, Boeing is waking up, uh, Lufthansa, I think, is waking up, and they are all trying to somewhere put roadblocks, much more than uh, 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 collaborating with us to get a, a single platform uh, across the region. That's true. The race and the speed uh, matters a lot. That's all.
but also the reason I mentioned the one hundred uh, airlines which will secure the critical sites on the market, which will be credible <coughs> to the authorities for the airport and many things. Thibault? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, you actually stole my question, that was my question as well, but uh, maybe I continue and, and note that, uh, that uh, for instance, Google had to make a choice between uh, you know, being in the product business uh, in their phones or Android or platform business and uh, that, that may actually be a question also for Airbus one day, whether you want to be an airline bit or building phones or running the platform. But I think I should give some background on this. Timo works for Nokia. Yeah. <laughs> but but I think that maybe the second question could be that uh, <clears throat> a lot of this uh, multi-sided platform business uh, or the research has been related to where the consumers has the strong role and they are kind of making the choice. Now this is uh, very much more like a B two B type platform where there may be some a little consumer uh, influence, but but still I kind of gather that. Uh, most of these uh, these 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 uh, questions that you deal in the in the platform, they are related to B two B type setups where these liabilities and many other things are so important. Uh, is there really a good theory to kind of a, um, combine uh, such a multi-sided platforms where the consumer has the strong role, which behave differently because consumers are less intelligent maybe than the companies are or at least they have different, less information available. Uh, so does the, the theory of multi-sided platform apply the same way to the consumer market than it applies to the B2B market? Probably for you, uh, Maybe uh, what A short answer would be, I think, when we model, like in economics, I think probably businesses are better because they're more rational. I mean, for consumers, there's a lot, they may be, I mean, I, I agree, but I think, that, yeah, of course it applies. I mean, broadly speaking, I think the same forces are at play. But you're right, like, if you look at uh, more in-depth at decision-making, I've heard this many times, like, when you deal with businesses, mm. it, maybe it's harder because sales, uh, the sales cycles are longer, but at least they respond to economic, like, they always, businesses always respond to economic incentives. True, but if you think about multi-sided platforms in the consumer markets, particularly when you have multiple those platforms competing to each other, then you can see interesting developments there, the, the, when the platforms are competing against each other, and when they are kind of a, a pulling the consumers in, trying to get the consumers in, you cannot do the same things in the B2B. Well, unless you do what I mentioned at the end of my fourth scenario. So the, I've seen this happen where basically there are companies that are obviously in B2B and they're competing in B2B, but then they're worried that someone actually is going to go, you know, is going to take the extra step and go to consumers. And somehow there's this idea that the company that gets the, the end customer, which is the consumer, will have more power than everyone else. And I'm sure you can relate to this, right? And there's platforms like at the bottom of the stack, and then all of a sudden someone gets to the top of the stack and there's a sense, if I own the consumer, then everyone else is going to be a commodity, yeah. basically. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I had one question uh, for you, Jean-Luc, about uh, data. Uh, do you have data um, on uh, the way your customers use their uh, planes and so on. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine you can offer them services, for instance, on uh, uh, you know how they should use their fleet, but also give them counts, uh, you know, advice on how you know, what would be the next, the good next planes to buy and so on. Uh, on the other hand, there must be somewhat to it that you are using this data and transmitting it to your sales force when they go and bargain with them. Uh, how do you, I mean, what are the instruments you have contractually to guarantee, you know, that you have the proper access and not too much and that you use the data in the right way? This is a very good question. Um, I think that there is three answers there. The first one is the data belongs, and it's about to whom belongs the data, and the big debate where at the end, uh, uh, I just conclude I don't care as long as I can use it. So then uh, it can be your data, and uh, that's what uh, Electricité de France is doing as well. Uh, yeah, they get our data and uh, uh, they use it. So first, the data are anyway uh, an agreement between the airline, the consumer, the supplier as well, because we are also some supplier now, can be the airport soon. Uh, 
that it's their data. The way we enrich the data by putting ours value-added in, including potentially some additional data source from external ecosystem like third party, like Radar24 as an example, which is also providing additional information to the airline, but not just to us. It's really a value had already on the data itself, and that data belongs to us, as long as we have put, in, put already uh, some uh, additional, uh, uh, let's say, uh, feature on it. But we share, meaning that uh, the benefit, the immediate benefit is that for the airline, the data is already enriched, combined, linked, and they get the benefit. For us, obviously, it's a lot of learning experience because we know our product when we produce the product, we don't know how it operates. The way the product behaves in service in different conditions, it's also a lot of learning for us. We get a lot from there. Hopefully, uh, we will export, uh, we will uh, uh, use in our future design all of that learning. So that's also a benefit for us. Seeing and experiencing the way the airline are operating the product, the way they maintain the product, the cost, of the life cycle of the aircraft also, where you can have the mass, you can make the simulation, but at the end, the real life is significantly different. So that's the second one. And the third one is really now opening the, 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 the door and neutralizing the data, meaning having data which are not linked to an airline, but uh, the general data, enabling best practice, is also attracting new actors in the ecosystem, such as the authority and the regulator. If we can demonstrate that the safety of a company, of an airline, is far better than another one, it may influence also the passenger that will select another airline. And that's also an interest for the authority, to look about safety and the way the airline are, are taking care of safety. And that's, at the beginning, neutralized and may lead to a litigation later on. So this is something where the market is getting together. The authority are obviously interested to get a platform, to obviously be a bit independent so far from the platform, but to look about the safety report that the airline are forced to, uh, to publish, to combine them, and to get statistics or worldwide statistics uh, across that. That's also one of the values that we are providing. Any, yeah? Thank you. Uh, it, Quite curious, so I sort of categorize a lot of this session uh, as having been uh, about sort of the benefits of platforms, right? About the, the, the opportunities that they can offer, indeed, some traditional firms, traditional industries, uh, and ways in which they can evolve their business models. And I would characterize uh, so Tomaso's uh, session from this morning uh, as uh, when <laughs> platforms go bad. And uh, sort of leading on from the comment from my neighbor uh, before, there's a sort of interesting uh, gap between these two. Uh, these two kind of uh, extremes. Uh, I think you also see this in sometimes in the, the political rhetoric as well in Europe when uh, you, we hear a lot of complaints about uh, big tech, particularly American big tech, uh, and often this, this sometimes sounds a little bit like, why can't we have our own rent-seeking platforms here in Europe? Um, and uh, so my, my question is, is really, uh, uh, if, if firms are, uh, are in terms of can benefit from this, uh, well, not just firms, if firms and their suppliers and consumers can benefit from this transition to, from pipeline to platform. And this offers you know, kind of economic opportunities, uh, uh, new synergies, new business models. Um, but this then poses in the future particular problems. Uh, what's missing? Uh, if we know that this is going to be a repeated problem in the future, what, what kind of ex ante regulation might be missing to, so that we get the right kinds of platforms or the right size platforms or whatever it might be? Yeah, I can try. As I said at the end of my presentation, and as Jacques said at the beginning, the, the starting point should be to understand well what's happening dynamically in these industries, which we are very far from it. So even in the short term, let's say the Skyline, Skywise, uh, system, the John Deere system, um, some consortia in pharma do the same thing of information sharing. They both have a flavor of public good because it's basically what you try to attain, right? You try to do information sharing and create basically a, a, a public good point that will benefit the whole industry. So you're right, that will benefit, you know, and therefore competition may change because after all, quality may increase because, you know, there may be more. Whatever. The problem for competition policy is the dynamic effect, is that once you're established platform and you are basically essential, 
is there a chance that you can abuse this position? That's, that's I think, what Tommaso was more concerned about, rather than the immediate short-term effect. So there is no, I think, paradox between what, what he said here and the competition policy authorities' point of view. Um, I had in my slide, I removed the, uh, there is a platform by McCormick. They do spices, you know, and they ask people to taste uh, their taste, customer taste in order to match. I don't think there will be a big concern for competition policy for this type of platform because there is already a lot of competition for this type of things. But for, for big industries where you have first few competitors, because, you know, you have few competitors. Yeah. yeah, you're a duopoly. Then the concern may be loom large that maybe, you know, in 10 years, something may be used with an abuse. So I think there is no, there is no, it's, I mean, in a certain way, it's an efficiency of funds. You create a good public good that may go against you after a while. Uh, but I think that's basically, so regulation, I think is complicated because you need a crystal ball to understand what's going on dynamically. And we are far from, I think we are far from it, so. That's what I would say. John? In a classical way to understand dynamic competition. And the, uh, the conclusion, the, con um, the results or the outcome that, they, 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 that the author uh, see is that uh, you have a, uh, um, states where uh, competition is low and and you know other re regimes where competition is, is more is higher and in 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 the welfare perspective uh, actually you don't know really what what is happening i mean uh, the welfare losses or, or or the welfare gains from information sharing um, actually are not not quite uh, big and and well you don't you cannot conclude that Consumers are losing welfare, uh, and um, well, uh, that, that's that's the main the main conclusion. So I, I don't know if it's uh, applied to this case, but uh, there is at least a work that, that's trying to understand what are uh, what are the dynamics of, of competition. I'm not saying there's nothing, but yeah. okay. Uh, I think uh, Yasin will know if I'm right. I think it's time for us to. Uh, uh, to stop this uh, round table. Uh, before letting you applaud the participants, I want to remind you there is a cocktail in the same room where you've had coffee and so on, and the official inauguration of a TSC uh, Digital Center. But thank you very much to the three of you. It was uh, very, very interesting. Thank you.